Father, anoint my lips, our ears, and this teaching today we ask in Christ's name. Amen. My name is Eliezer, which means God is my strength. I'm one of the sons of the prophets. Our school is located on the outskirts of the village of Gilgal, which is about five miles or so from the Jordan River, just north of Jericho. Have you ever experienced that sinking feeling of hopelessness and helplessness? Boy, I sure have. And I'm going to tell you my story today. But before I do, let me give you some context. The times that we are living in are troublesome indeed. The people of Israel, for the most part, are apostate. We have had skirmish after skirmish with the Syrian king Hazael. Speaking of king Hazael, can you believe it? God told Elijah, the prophet, to anoint Hazael king over Syria when he ran away from Jezebel to Mount Sinai. I don't know what God was thinking. Some of the cities of, uh, east of the Jordan in the tr uh, tribe of Manasseh have been captured by Hazael. You know, we have never fully recovered from King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's open idolatry. More and more people vacillate between serving God and serving Baal. As hopeless as it seems, my father was one of the men after Elijah's ministry that never bowed the knee to Baal. He raised me and my siblings to worship the true God. And part of his commitment to God is to, for me to get a spiritual, religious education. Thus, my father has insisted that I go to the school of the prophets. As you might expect, the living conditions here at the local school of the prophets is not ideal. Rooms are cramped. Food is rather plain. We don't have the amenities and programs that the local public schools have. Ours is a rather austere life of the prophets. Plain, simple, no frills, no extras. We haven't had much income from the uh, latest scrolls. Many of the Israelites uh, don't feel that it's necessary to return tithe, so we barely eke out an existence. Consequently, we make the best of the little we have. One thing I can say about this is it's taught me to depend on God daily. Enough complaining, though. Zip the lips. I want to share with you one of the blessings that has been a part of my life. The prophet Elisha visits our campus often. Talk about a celebrity. He's pretty humble about it, though. But all of us students are pretty awed by the stories that circulate about his ministry. I mean, we heard about the she-bears that mauled those teenagers who were mocking him. We've heard about the fact that he even raised someone from the dead. He's healed leprosy. And Naaman, Naaman, he wasn't even an Israelite. He insisted that we feed 100 extra men once, and we didn't even have enough food for ourselves. No problem. God was so amazing and kept multiplying the little bit that we had. And believe it or not, everyone ate. And after they ate, we still had enough for all of the schools, uh, students in the school of the prophet to have full stomachs as well. Then there was the day that Elisha 
blinded the whole Syrian army and led them to the palace of the king of Israel. Wow, that was amazing. When they were surrounded in the city, then Elisha asked God to remove the scales from their eyes, and, 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 and they were astonished to find themselves prisoners of the king of Israel. But again, I diverge. One spring day, the prophet Elisha again came to visit our school here in Gilgal. As he was talking to our administrator, one of our uh, many challenges was shared with him. Prophet Elisha, the living quarters for the, our students and faculty are too cramped. Do you have a word from the Lord for us? We're thinking that, 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 that maybe we should go down to the Jordan River and, and cut down a few trees and, 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 and haul them back here and, and build an addition to our dormitory on campus. It would certainly help make things easier for the students on cold days. They could study indoors if the rooms were bigger. Elisha responded, that's a great idea. Go and do it immediately and God be with you. But we replied, Elisha, please go with us. We would really appreciate your presence and support. That's what I loved. We all loved about Elisha. Yes, he was a prophet of God. But he didn't mind getting his hands dirty. He was willing to pitch in and help us. Sure, I'll be glad to go with you, he told us. So we gathered the tools we had. Some of us, like me, borrowed tools from people in the community so that we could each do our work. We walked on the war, worn road from Gilgal to the Jordan River. It took us about two hours to get there. And once there, we, survived, we surveyed the trees and, and each of us chose a tree so that we would have enough to do, enough wood to do the addition. We'd been swinging our axes blow after blow, cutting into the wood chunk by chunk. I pulled back the ax and swung it with great force against the trunk again. This time, to my horror, the ax head broke off from the handle, flying through the air, plunk and splash right into the middle of the muddy Jordan River. I helplessly watched it sink to the bottom. What a hopeless, sinking feeling. Oh my, I cried out. Master, what shall I do? What shall I do? It was a borrowed ax, and, 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 and I don't have any money to buy another one. The prophet Elisha quickly ran to my side. Eliezer, show me where it fell. Wow. He even knew my name. Trembling, I led him to the bank of the Jordan, approximately where I saw the splash. There, I said, pointing several yards toward the middle of the Jordan. He looked up, prayed, then broke off a branch from one of the trees we'd cut down. I wondered what would happen. He looked at the branch then again, he looked up to heaven. Without another word, he threw the branch into the middle of the Jordan River where I told him the axe head had gone in. Imagine the shock we all had when the axe head, heavy iron, floated to the surface where the branch had been thrown. Axe heads don't float, you know. Branches do, but axes don't. But this axe head did. And it wasn't the only thing floating that day. I was on cloud nine. Elijah, Elijah, Elisha called out. Are you still with me? Pick up the axe head. Don't just stand there. 
staring at it. I waded out in the deep, muddy waters of the Jordan River and picked up the heavy axe head floating on the surface of the water. Dripping wet, I struggled to shore and stared at the axe head in my hand. Unbelievable, I thought. Can this be true? That day, I experienced a miracle bigger than a floating axe head. I told you my name is Eliezer, which means God is my strength. I had grown up in the church. I had attended our religious schools all my life. Now I was in seminary, but for the first time in my life, I discovered that truly God is my strength. He was Elisha's strength. And you know what? He'll be your strength too. We took some creative liberty in the retelling of this story. We don't know the name of this young man, this member of the Sons of the Prophets, but we do know that a miracle happened that day. So let's review the facts of this story. Number one, the man's ax head fell off into the muck and of the mire of the muddy Jordan River. He was unable to get the ax head back. He told Elisha, the man of God, it was borrowed. It wasn't even his own. He showed Elisha where he lost it. And then God intervened and saved the day. Wow. Great story. Entertaining. Wonderful children's bedtime story. So what? Are there lessons for you and me today? Are there practical applications for our lives and challenges we face here and now? Consider these five observations that I've personally discovered in studying this story. Perhaps there are more, but these are five that I chose to come up with. Number one, the cold iron axe is a picture of every lost sinner. The cold iron axe head is a picture of every lost sinner. Lesson number two. The River Jordan is a picture of the sinner being dead and totally separated from God. Lesson number three, and I might add, I, I kind of felt that this one was the most significant. It really spoke to me as, a, as I saw it emerge. The branch, the branch is the game changer. Now follow me. I don't know whether you've contemplated this before, but just think about it. Trees are an interesting motif in Scripture. I mean, in the Garden of Eden, we have the tree of life, and it was a symbol to provide eternal life to Adam and Eve and their offspring. And there in the Garden of Eden, in fact, at the foot of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Satan deceived the human race. It was Jesus Christ who died on a tree to redeem humanity for eternity. Yet another tree. In the New Jerusalem, the tree of life will again provide the symbol of eternity to mankind. And so I think it's fitting that a branch would be used to make the iron axe head float. In a messianic prophecy, Isaiah the prophet says this in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The branch 
is a picture of Jesus Christ being cut down on Calvary and going down into the grave to raise up lost, fallen sinners. The branch in this story in 2 Kings chapter 6 is the game changer. And the branch can be the game changer for you and me. Lesson number four, God cares about our needs. You know, some people uh, might scoff at this story and, and say this, this miracle is trivial. Others might say, well, hey, listen, it serves this son of the prophet right. He was probably careless in his, in his use of this, of this axe, and, and, and he, it didn't even belong to him anyway. So he got what he deserved. But none of our challenges are too small or too big for God to handle. Oh my goodness, that must have gone right by you. I'm going to repeat it again. None of our challenges are too big or too small for God to handle. Amen. Amen. While the situation may seem trivial to some, it wasn't to the son of the prophet who experienced this mishap. Think about it. It was borrowed. Now, what does that tell you? It was borrowed. This axe was borrowed. The son of the prophet likely didn't have the financial resources to own his own axe. Remember, he was a student. And most students I know usually aren't flush with a lot of cash. Now he lost the axe head. And not only did he likely not have enough money to own one himself... How on earth would he have enough money to replace this lost axe head? I love this powerful quotation from the book Steps to Christ, page 100. Listen to it carefully. Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up worlds. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer. No sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant or in which He takes no immediate interest. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share His watch care, not another soul for whom He gave His beloved Son. Wow. God cares for us. And this story reminds us of that. And finally, Lesson number five. The swimming axe head is a picture of the miracle of salvation. The psalmist wrote these words in Psalm 40 and verse 2. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. This story of 2 Kings chapter 6 speaks loud and clear to me. I need it as much as anyone. I find many parallels in this story with my life today. The sons of the prophets experienced numerous challenges on their campus. And then the sinking feeling of losing the axe head with no way to repay it. I must admit, I step back and take a look at the challenges on our campus. At times, they're overwhelming, daunting. I don't have to enumerate them. 
Most of you know the huge challenges that we've encountered on our campus over the past couple of years. This story reminds me that God is in control and cares about us. And he wants us to bring our cares to him. Listen to these words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And the Apostle Peter admonishes us as well to cast all our cares upon him, he says, for he cares for you. It may, be a it may not be a lost, borrowed axe head, but whatever it is, my friends, Jesus cares for you. Amen? So what burden do you have to bring to him today? Why not, my friends? Why not cast all your cares on him? upon you I lay all of my burdens down at your feet and any time that I don't know what to do, do I just cast all my cares upon you Join us I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I just cast all my cares upon you. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I just cast all my cares upon you. I just cast all my cares upon you. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, as we think about the experience of this story in 2 Kings chapter 6, a situation to that young man that seemed hopeless and he felt helpless, he discovered the miracle in his life. And thank you, Lord, for these kinds of stories that inspire us to know that there isn't anything too big or too small for you to care about. And so whatever burden it is that we experience today, any trial, trouble, challenge we have, we come to you as you have asked us to do and to cast all our cares on you. Bless us now, Lord, with your love and your grace and your mercy. And now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.